Hi everyone, this is a talk describing how to use Imaris Viewer, a free three-dimensional visualization software. So you can get this for free from the Bitplane website. Bitplane is the company that makes this software. I'm not going to go over uh, how to do that or how to install it. That's all fairly easy. So I'm just going to dive in by double-clicking on Imaris Viewer and getting started. So Imaris, when you open it, typically opens in the arena mode. There is also the surpass mode, which is what allows you to actually uh, view your data in detail. Arena is more like a fancy file explorer. Uh, when you install Imaris Viewer, it comes with a bunch of uh, demo data. And so that demo data is shown here. This is just a particular folder uh, where that demo data lives on my computer. And so you can see that um, within this folder with the demo data, there are some subfolders and there are some data sets. And for each data set, uh, Imaris shows you these little previews here, uh, as well as uh, some, some sort of more information, the name of the file, the extension, which for all of these files is .ims. As, and in addition, it shows you the size and the dimensions in X, Y, Z channels and time. And there's sort of a shorthand uh, icon here for each of the images, which also gives you a bunch of information. So ones that have this icon mean they are three-dimensional data sets. Uh, ones that have these icons with this means they are not MRS files. And um, so actually I was mistaken. There's one here that is not an MRS file and that need to be converted. So that means it sort of needs conversion. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Ones that have this cube and little lines mean they are three-dimensional data sets. This sort of blob that looks kind of like a cell with a nucleus and other vesicles, that means that uh, this data was analyzed in MRS and an object called a cell was made. Uh, there are also things like this. So um, the, these sort of splotches and dots means that this image was analyzed and uh, elements called surfaces or spots were added to that. And finally, this little leaf uh, reflects the fact that uh, filaments were incorporated into this image. So you can see there's a lot of information here. Uh, just by looking at it, you get a, a sense of uh, how the data is structured. If you don't like the way these things look and prefer to explore a different way of, of sort of looking at, at, at all of your data, you can go down here to zoom and you can say compact details, which is where we were. You can have large icons, small icons, medium icons, etc. Um, so I'll just leave it here for now, but you can just explore that and, and really display you know, your data sets however is most comfortable to you. Uh, in addition to uh, just the, the, the demo data, uh, you can look at your own data. And so the way you do that is you have to put your data in a particular folder that then you can observe uh, so that the, the sort of the Amaris viewer can, can, can look at what's in there and show it with this sort of nice display. And so I have on the desktop of my computer here um, in, in, in my office, a folder that I've prepared with a few sort of representative data sets. So you can see this process and also I'll show you some of those data sets later. So the way you add a folder to this uh, arena mode in MRS Viewer is by clicking here, observe folder. And so now we need to kind of navigate to where it was. So I told you it was on the desktop. It's in actually this MRS Viewer seminar folder and here in data for workshop. So this is the folder that I want to add. So I'm gonna click select. And so now you can see uh, in this folder, we have sort of four different data sets. Some of them, like this one, for example, is not 3D and it's a time-lapse, so a 2D time-lapse. These two are 3D and this one's 3D and has a bunch of other elements. Uh, in that folder, I have a subfolder called confocal files. And in here, you can see these are three-dimensional data sets and they all need to be converted. These are .lsm files that were acquired on our um, one of our Zeiss confocals. And so now what I'm gonna show you is how you can convert these files to the Amaris format. And so the way you can do that is uh, I will do it for all of them. So I'm just gonna select all of them uh, by uh, kind of uh, shift clicking. And then I'm gonna right click here uh, and say convert to native Amaris file format. When I do that down here, I'll have the progress of that. So it's very fast because these are small files. And so now they've been converted to Amaris. Uh, and so we can actually open them in the software. Um, if we look at the actual folder where this took place, uh, you can see 
uh, in confocal files, which is where we were, these are the files that I had uh, in there, which are you know from several years ago. And these are the files that MRS just made uh, from these, converting them to the MRS format. OK, so those are the sort of things that you can do uh, in this arena mode, is basically just sort of explore your data and kind of navigate it in a user-friendly way. Um, Let's go and dive right into one of the data sets and start looking at the surpass mode in MRS. So uh, let's look at this cell demo membrane 3D data set uh, and see what we can, we can learn about how to use MRS from this. So I'm going to double click here. And uh, once we're in the surpass mode, uh, we have, so this is sort of how you visualize data. We now have three different display modes. Um, there's 3D view where you see things in 3D. There's slice view, where you see individual slices, and there's sections, where you see kind of side views. So we're going to start uh, by describing uh, what you can do with the software in slice view, uh, because you really, you can do a lot even here, and it's, and it's easier to explain some basic things about the software in this display mode. So uh, one of the things that um, you should be aware of is that uh, for many file formats, uh, when you open it in MRS, all the scaling is correct. So whatever your pixel sizes were in XY and whatever your spacings were in the Z dimension, if you took a three-dimensional data set, or in the time dimension, if you took a time lapse, or in both, they will typically be read correctly by MRS viewer. However, if you have kind of a custom microscope or something maybe older, that may not be the case. And so you should check uh, that things are, are properly scaled if you're not sure whether Imaris made that conversion correctly. The way you do that is you go to the edit uh, menu and you look at image properties. So in image properties, uh, in geometry, you have the voxel size in X, Y, and Z. And so this is the, so these two refer to the pixel size and this is sort of the interval in Z. And if you had a, a time lapse, this is also where uh, it would tell you kind of what the, what the interval was in the time lapse or the total time elapsed. Um, so you might wanna go in here and just check that everything here is correct. So uh, another thing, uh, sort of one, one, one absolutely critical element whenever uh, you're using Imaris is this display adjustment window. So there is a lot that you can do here to adjust how things look. Um, you will never be adjusting the actual data with this, but you, you can make major adjustments to how things look visually and, and sort of highlight certain features and make things easier to see. And so we really need to understand uh, how to use this. But before that, we need to understand just, you know, we need to know where is this if it doesn't pop up automatically. And so uh, that, uh, display adjustment window lives here in edit and so you can go to edit menu and just say show display adjustment or control D and that will make it come up so um, there's a lot going on here uh, let's go through it one element at a time so uh, this window shows uh, as many channels as are present in the data and we can turn those channels, uh, the display of those channels on and off by hitting these check marks. So we can, for example, turn off the channel called plasma membrane, turn off the channel called DNA, even turn them both off, though I'm not sure why we would do that. Um, so that's the very basic thing you can do. You can sort of turn channels on and off. Uh, another thing you can do is change the color in which the information from a channel uh, is displayed. So let's, for example, go uh, to uh, the color that we're using for plasma membrane and try to change it to a green color. So if I click where it says plasma membrane uh, on sort of the name, I get this, which is sort of another part of image properties, this window that we've already been in. Uh, but now we're, we're centered on sort of channels one and we have this color wheel. And so this color wheel shows you uh, the current color being displayed, which is sort of 100% red and 0% green and blue, which is uh, also kind of noted by the position of this little square here. We could very easily change this to some of the, the sort of typical colors that are used for displaying information. So we could change it to green, cyan, blue, magenta, or yellow. Or we could sort of put it in the middle, which would be 111, and change it to a grayscale. So let's see some of these changes. So for example, there I've put it on a grayscale, and so we can see it uh, here very clearly. Uh, so what channel, so what sort of colors should you use is, is up to you. 
um, I recommend you take a few things into account. First, if you if you are not sure and, and, and you really want to explore a channel in detail, uh, it's a good option to look at channels one at a time in a grayscale because a grayscale is really um, kind of very useful to see fine features, whereas something like, for example, blue may be very hard for you. It may be very hard for you to, 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 to see kind of slight changes in intensity. Uh, the other thing you want to keep in mind is if you use, for example, a red, green, and blue scheme, uh, actually the prevalence of color blindness, particularly in, in men, is, is fairly high. Uh, so that might not be a very good color scheme um, because there are a lot of folks who will not be able to really tell apart the red and the green. Um, in this case, what I'm going to do, just for the sake of, the, of this demo, is just change it from red to green so we can see it here. Uh, one other thing that, that you can do uh, in that um, sort of window is uh, that, that sort of pops up when we click on plasma membrane is change the name of channels. And so, uh, you know, this one says plasma membrane. It looks like the plasma membrane. It's sort of demo data from MRI, so that's probably correct. Um, but sometimes uh, when, when data comes off a microscope, it, it may have the name of a filter here which is maybe less informative. And so you might want to change it, like this might have said Fitzy or Texas Red or Sci-5. So you might want to change it to something that's biologically uh, more relevant and sort of more immediately comprehensible when you look here. Or you may want to leave it the same. That's completely up to you. Um, so let, let, let's talk about um, now how we adjust the kind of brightness and contrast of this image. Um, so what adjustments we can make. So before I do that, uh, uh, I'm going to reset all channels. So these channels have a number of adjustments already, which came you know, um, from MR. So I'm just going to reset everybody by clicking this button here. Um, so this is sort of a default display mode, which is kind of more accurately representing what came off uh, the microscope. And so what things can we do here? Uh, and why would we do them? And, and sort of what are we actually, uh, how are we modifying uh, the visualization of the data when we do them? So you can see that uh, for both DNA and plasma membrane, there are three triangles here. So if you grab the right-hand triangle on the top and drag it to the left, you will make the image brighter. In addition, this number called max will get smaller, and I'll explain why that's the case in a moment. If instead you grab the left-hand triangle and move it to the right, you will make, and I'm just going to uh, maybe do that. It's a little bit easier to see what happens with the DNA channel. So let me actually put the DNA channel on and put it on uh, the gray. So in the center, it'll be easier to see the effect of that. So uh, again, I've described what happens when you grab the right-hand triangle and move it to the left, basically it gets brighter, the channel gets brighter, and these are channel specific adjustments. So if I do this for the DNA, I'm not gonna be affecting the plasma membrane channel. So what happens if I move the left hand um, triangle to the right? So what happens is that pixels that are dim, uh, you know, kind of become dimmer and eventually uh, are in the black. So it's a way of, if there is sort of dim background, of removing it. Again, none of these affect the data. They just affect how the data is displayed. And you can see that when I move this sort of left-hand um, triangle, this number here in this box that says minimum gets bigger. Now, if you don't see these numbers, it's because you need to click here on where it says advanced. This is actually not that advanced. I mean, it's, it's something actually very useful. These numbers can be extremely useful when you're trying to uh, adjust things. Um, so, so what are all these numbers and, and how do you make these adjustments uh, in, a, in a way that makes sense? Um, so, so the key insight here to understand what these numbers are is that any image is actually a matrix of numbers. So if you look here, uh, the way I have this displayed, and it may not be the way you have it displayed, and I'll, and I'll show you um, later why that might be, uh, you can see sort of barely these little squares. And so for each square, if I put the cursor on it, if you look on the lower left-hand side of the screen, so down here, you will see a bunch of numbers. Okay, and so for example, the numbers in, in, in this particular square where I'm, I'm on right now, say 105, 3,267, and then it says at, and in parentheses it has three numbers, 
and it says microns. And so what, what, what are all those numbers? So all those numbers are the following. The first number is the intensity uh, in the plasma membrane channel. So, and, and that sort of reflects, is proportional to how much light came from that location in the sample that's represented by that pixel. Uh, the second number is the intensity of the DNA channel. Uh, so it's the, the intensity of that pixel for the DNA channel, which again reflects how much light came from the sort of DNA marking fluorophore uh, from the sample at the location represented by that pixel. And then the three other numbers are the physical location. So it's basically X, Y, and Z. And so in the current place where I'm hovering, uh, if you look, you'll see that, that, the, that the number for the plasma membrane is sort of relatively low. It's near 100, whereas the one for the DNA is relatively high. It's 3,000. If I go outside the sample, both numbers are actually quite low. If I turn on sort of the plasma membrane channel and go to the plasma membrane itself, you'll see that now the number uh, on the plasma membrane is actually really high, whereas the one for the, for the DAPI is much lower. So really images are just a bunch of numbers. And so what the computer needs to be able to show us something on the screen are rules that turn the numbers into colors. And so how does it figure out what those rules are, it's based on a combination of sort of the color scheme here and these numbers. So let me show you that a little bit more explicitly. Um, let me do this with the, with the DNA channel. So if we go here, if I click where it says DNA, uh, and if now I abandon sort of this base color tab and go instead to mapped color, we can see explicitly uh, the, the sort of one of the, the, the elements of this relationship between the numbers and how bright things look. And so what you see here is sort of a grid of squares. There are about 100 squares here. It's about 10 on each side, I think. Um, and so you see they start in the top left-hand corner being very, very dark. So these are sort of black squares. And as you move from left to right and top to down, you know, they get brighter and brighter and brighter until it's sort of very bright white. And so what, what is this? So what this is, is the options that the software has for assigning colors to intensities. So again, this is this image is the, the, the actual underlying data of this image is a bunch of numbers. The software has to turn those numbers into something on your screen. So these are the options. So this is uh, for every number it needs to have, uh, every number needs to be assigned to one of these colors. Uh, so this is also called the lookup table because the idea being the software can look up numbers uh, and say, oh, these numbers are assigned to this color, these numbers are assigned to this color, and so far, and so, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, how do are those assignments made? So these are the options. The way the assignments are made depend on these three parameters, minimum, maximum, and gamma. And so for now, I'm going to ignore gamma. We'll come back to it later. It, it, it has its place and its usefulness. Um, so what is, what is minimum? So minimum, the number here means pixels that have this intensity or lower correspond to that color. The maximum means pixels that have this intensity or higher correspond to this color. And everything in between is scaled linearly from the minimum to the maximum. So for example, if this is 10 by 10 and there are 100 here, if the maximum were 1,000, like so, which doesn't give a good result, but bear with me just a moment. Uh, what that would mean is that as we increase by around 10 units, we get a new color. So this square would be, uh, if we had pixels of an intensity from 0 to 10, this one would be from 11 to 20, this one would be from 21 to 30, and so on and so forth, all the way to 991 to 1,000. Now, in this particular example, that doesn't make sense because we're sort of making everything be... Uh, saturated in the display. And so that tells us that actually we need a, a bigger number here uh, to, to make this something that, that where the visualization is reasonable. Uh, that also explains why if we increase the minimum, a lot more things look dark. Because for example, if we make this number 1000, what we're telling the software is Pixels that have an intensity of 1,000 or less should be black, and then we need to scale linearly from 1,000 to 2,500. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure how, how much you know we would move. I'd have to do the arithmetic for, for sort of each box. But now what we've, we've, we've sort of cut off, everything below 1,000 is now completely dark. And so um, 
we, we sort of remove things that maybe were background or maybe were not, um, but they've now been confined to this one. And again, the scaling is always linear. So if we, so for example, if we decrease the maximum, so if we make the number you need to get here lower, we're automatically making all the numbers lower. So that's why things get brighter. Okay. Um, and so, you know, when we're adjusting things, what we need to do is, is, is try not to hide things, uh, you know, that, that are actually in the sample. Uh, so this background may, there, you know, may be real and for very good reasons. Uh, or if you look at a control, it may be the same, just some autofluorescence, in which case we can kind of get rid of it. Uh, the same goes for plasma membrane. We need to make adjustments in a way that are sort of a faithful representation of our data. Um, I will return to gamma uh, in a moment. Uh, for now, let me let me sort of show you a few more things here. Uh, I mentioned that the way the display is set up on my computer, you can see these little squares, okay? Um, that is because I have a parameter called interpolation turned off. And that's because I, I like to see the actual structure of the data. But in many cases, you don't need to see the actual structure of the data. You can get, kind of get a smooth version of it. And that's sort of more pleasing to the eye. And really, um, you, you, sort of, it, it, you don't really, if you're not looking at you know, fine details, uh, it doesn't lead you too far astray. So uh, you can turn on interpolation by going to File, Preferences, Display. And if you click on interpolate, you'll see that now we have a sort of a smooth version of this. So uh, this is a matter of personal preference. What I, what I would strongly suggest is if you're looking at small details, turn the interpolation off because it can give you a, a false sense of, of how good the, um, the resolution of your system is. So I'm gonna turn it off. Uh, I prefer it off almost in all cases except maybe light sheet data. Uh, so I'm just gonna leave it there. Uh, so what, what what else can we can we do with, with with this image in terms of moving around and exploring it? So this is a three-dimensional data set, yet we've been stuck on a single slice of this data set this whole time. You can see a slider on the left-hand side. If we move this, what we are doing is looking at different z-planes of this stack of images. Okay, and you can see uh, this number down here is the number, uh, the, the slice number in the stack. Um, related to this is this display, which we toggle on and off with this Navi button. So what this does here is it shows you a maximum projection of this image. So it tries to summarize the data from all the planes into one image. And the way it does that is it looks at every pixel and it looks at the entire stack. And for every uh, pixel location, it shows you um, the version of the pixel in the stack that's the brightest. So it's sort of a way of smushing the whole thing together. And sometimes that's very effective. That can really provide a lot of, uh, of, of help so kind of getting a sense of the shape of the sample. In others, it creates kind of a, a, a bit of a mess like you see here. So I'll show you, uh, I have other examples that we're going to go through and I'll show you how those uh, lead to, um, how using this feature, excuse me, can really lead to a better understanding of what the sample looks like. So what else can we do? We can move in Z. We can also um, zoom in. So if we have either a trackpad with multi-gesture support or um, a mouse with the scroll wheel, which is sort of the most comfortable way of using MRS, if we point anywhere in the sample and we scroll in, we zoom pointing at that location. So what I mean by zooming pointing at that location is if I point here, it'll zoom with that. Whereas if I point here, it'll start zooming in that direction, sort of kind of a dynamic zoom, which is a nice feature. Once we're zoomed in, if we want to navigate around, if we want to move things uh, kind of around where we are, we can right click and then drag to move around the sample. We can also, in this window, once we're zoomed in, you can see there's this yellow box, we can uh, left click, uh, excuse me, right click, uh, my mistake, right click that box and we can move around. If we left click, uh, we actually move the, the the, the little uh, window with the maximum display uh, itself to whatever kind of corner of the software we want. If we get lost, we can also uh, hit fit to go back here. Um, all right, so uh, a few other things that uh, I want to show you uh, before we move on to uh, a different uh, a different image. So, so one thing uh, that you might uh, want to do quite frequently is take a snapshot so that you can show uh, in a presentation, for example, what uh, you were seeing when you were using MRS Viewer. And so to do that, uh, you use this button. 
it's a good idea before starting snapshots to click here on this little triangle and look at the preferences to make sure these are set however you want. The main thing is to determine where the images, um, where the snapshots are going to go. Um, so you can uh, always ask uh, where they want them to go. You can put a source image directory, meaning it'll, it'll just go wherever the image data is, or have a custom directory, which is why what I did, I put, I, I made a sort of a snapshots folder to just make my life easier. Um, Right now, the size of the snapshot is set to window, so it'll just take a snapshot of whatever's in here, uh, aside from the menus. You can also make it fixed. So for example, you might make it fixed to the size of your sample, and so that's an option here. The DPI really doesn't change the resolution of the, of the image, um, so you can increase it or decrease it. It just changes the size in inches of the image, but it doesn't really change uh, the resolution. And then for saving as image type, I strongly suggest you don't use JPEG. Um, I don't have enough experience with PNG to really know if it's a good idea or not. Uh, I just use TIFFs, um, really, because the, the problem with JPEGs is that they are a lossy form of, comp of compression. So it's a, it's a smaller image format. It compresses, which is good. Uh, but in that process of compression, it throws away information. And so you, you never want to do that. You never want to throw away information from your image because it might you know, obscure certain details or, or, or make the image look a little bit weird. So I would use TIFF. And so these are the settings. Let's say they're OK. And so now if I want to take a snapshot, I can just press this button and I've taken a snapshot. And it's usually a good idea um, if, you're have, if, you, if you're thinking ahead to a presentation to take snapshots uh, you know, where you highlight different things, but where, where most of the image is the same. So you know, if you take an image of this, you might also want to take an image of just the, the DNA channel and of just the plasma membrane channel. And then if you look, uh, let's see, where do I have the snapshots? If you look here, uh, you can see, you know, you can kind of change very quickly uh, from one channel to the other to the combination. And, and you can see how effective that would be from a presentation standpoint, sort of layering on different pieces of information uh, by just clicking through various images. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of empty space here. This is perhaps not the best sample in which to have taken the full window snapshot. Um, it might have been better to sort of constrain it, uh, but you can sort of play around with that with your own data sets and determine what would make for a, a kind of a nice snapshot. So um, those are some of the things I wanted to show you that, that are very nicely illustrated with this data set. Uh, now I, I really want to discuss the issue of gamma uh, which was this other parameter we, we really hadn't discussed, but this is not the best data set to do it. So I'm going to go back to Arena. It's asking me whether I want to save the changes. I don't. Uh, and let's open up um, a data set that will be much better for um, exploring that gamma parameter. So I'm going to open one called Pyramidal Cell. This is, again, one of the Amaris uh, demo uh, images. And so you should have it as well. Um, it's in slice mode. I'm going to change the channel to um, gray. So I'm going to make everything uh, red, green, and blue one, which is sort of similar to kind of clicking in the middle. So I'm going to say OK. And the reason is this just makes it a little bit easier to see things. And so um, this is a Z stack. And so we can move through this by moving the, the, the Z slider. And so uh, this is a neuron. And in neurons, what happens is that if you label them uh, by injecting, for example, a dye, um, kind of the big parts of the neuron have a lot of dye per sort of um, unit volume image, whereas the small parts, uh, sometimes th that, that's less. Even if the concentration of the dye is the same everywhere, uh, these, item, these elements may be much smaller than the sampling unit of the microscope. And so they, they really have less dye per unit volume, and so they're harder to see. Um, so what can you do there? So what you can do, uh, and let me show you an example of things that may be a little bit hard to see. So for example, these things are a little bit hard. These things are a little bit hard to, to see uh, properly. And so kind of what can you do when you're in a situation like that? And so what you can do is uh, increase this gamma parameter. Uh, so the gamma parameter, you increase it by either typing in a bigger number or moving this to the left. What this does is uh, it affects the linearity of the conversion between numbers and these colors. If you increase the gamma, what you tell the computer is to uh, magnify the differences in color uh, when you have small differences in pixel intensity in pixels that are um, have sort of 
small intensities. So small differences between pixels of low intensity get magnified. At the same time, small differences between pixels of large intensity get flattened out. Um, so there isn't much difference. So you can see, um, you can better see small differences between dim things uh, at the expense of seeing small differences between big sort of um, intense things. And that's usually, uh, in, in, in many cases in biology, that's a trade-off worth making because a lot of things sort of scale volumetrically. You don't really care about, uh, in many cases, small differences between things that are really, really bright, whereas you really do care about um, sort of small differences in intensity between things that are very dim. And, and what it does is sort of flattens the image so you can see uh, things that are that are dim a little bit brighter relative to the bright stuff than if your uh, gamma parameter were one, uh, as it is here. So it's, it's really something you, you need to explore a bit but, but uh, for your particular data set, but it really helps when you have things that are really dim and really bright and you care about seeing both. Uh, because the other way of sort of making dim things brighter would be to reduce the maximum intensity. But what that does is it blows out the bright things. In contrast, if we increase the gamma, we don't blow out the bright things, but we bring up the dim stuff. So, so that, that's just an, an example uh, of a data set where this gamma really helps a lot. This is also an example of a data set where having this Navi on really gives you a, a, a really useful summary of the data set because this is a very three-dimensional data set with things kind of poking out uh, in every plane in every direction. This provides a view of sort of where all the signal is that can be quite useful. So um, as I mentioned before, you know, this may or may not be useful depending on your sample. This is an example of a sample uh, where this is really useful. So let me show you one more thing in the slice mode, uh, which is um, better illustrated with one of my own data sets. Um, so let me go here. These are my data sets, and I'm going to open this. So, so this uh, is a time lapse in 2D uh, that I took many years ago when I was a grad student. Uh, and it basically shows activation of a neuron as it releases neurotransmitter. When it releases neurotransmitter, uh, there's a, a, a fluorescent reporter that uh, you know outputs more photons, basically. And so let me do a few things here so you can see kind of the basics of this data set. I'm going to click here on the name of this channel. I'm going to make it gray. And this is now a time lapse. So we can either move this slider to see what happens a long time, or we can hit play, um, and it will sort of play this. And if you want to adjust how fast it moves, if you click here on open time settings, this is the sort of frame rate per second. You can say play one at a time, repeat forever, swing back and forth. There's a bunch of settings that you can kind of tweak to make it uh, more to your liking. Uh, here, the maximum intensity projection is just the same image. There is no Z, so this doesn't make much sense to have here. Um, and so what I wanted to illustrate with this data set, in addition to just how do you deal with the time lapse, is uh, the fact that some data sets are better displayed with a color scheme that's not just a pure color, like this sort of color wheel or you know, color hexagon, as it were, but instead a mapped color. So these mapped colors, if you click here, what you'll see is you can have... Uh, sort of coloring schemes that are not pure. Uh, they go from one color to another, uh, sort of glow scales, or from cool colors to hot colors. And these can be really useful uh, for cases when you're studying uh, fluorophores uh, or reporters uh, that change in response to activity, because they can highlight parts of something that are active, for example, in hot colors, and parts of something that are inactive in, in, in dim color, in sort of cool colors. So when I put this on, it, it, it just defaulted to something really weird. So I'm just going to auto adjust all, all, all channels by clicking here. And now if I move the slider across time, you can see how it's much easier to visualize what parts of the, this is an axon of a neuron and these sort of dots or, or, or synapses, what parts of these are active uh, as we, we, we stimulate this neuron electrically, which is what I did these sort of many years ago. Um, so you can see this kind of display scale is, is really, really useful um, when you have a dynamic process um, where some parts respond more than others. You can also imagine something like calcium imaging um, or, or even uh, some of the, the beautiful reporters that the, um, that the Han lab here at UNC has developed um, uh, for various uh, 
gpcrs uh, and so on and so forth so so you can imagine using things like this um, uh, and, and it can be a very sort of useful uh, way of displaying the data so um, that kind of concludes uh, everything i can think that you might find useful in the slice mode so now um, let's switch uh, to a data set that will illustrate some of the features and things that you can do in the section mode. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to go back to Arena and use a sample that will uh, better illustrate what we can do with the section mode. And so I'm going to go back to our old friend, Cell Demo Membrane 3D, and uh, I'm going to auto adjust, excuse me, reset all channels and then auto adjust them so that we can see something a little bit better here. And now I'm going to go to the section uh, view. So um, what are the features of this display mode? So we've gone uh, in, in a lot of detail on, sec on slice mode. What can we do in section and what are all these views? So in the section uh, display mode, we have in the top left-hand corner of the screen, an X, Y view of a single Z slice uh, of the Z stack of images. In the lower left-hand corner, uh, we have an X, Z view uh, of this sample. And in this top right-hand corner, we have a Y, so this is Y, Z view of the sample. And these lines here, which we can move, represent where these particular side views come from. So for example, if I leave this horizontal line here, uh, what we are seeing in this panel is an X, Z view of the sample as if it were cut with a virtual knife here. So remember, this, this sample is a Z stack, so it's almost like a virtual layer cake that we are cutting with a virtual knife along this line and looking at it from the side as it were so imagine if this is a cake with sort of cherries inside we're cutting it from the side and this is the view that we're observing on x and z similarly we can cut it from the other side so along this line and we see this view along the y z axis and if we move these lines we get different views so for example if i move this line here my view from the y z dimension uh, direction changes whereas if i move it over here my view uh so move it kind of like this my view in the x uh, z plane will change um, i can also engage navi as before and this will be a maximum projection uh, which again in this sample is perhaps not the most useful one um, but so um, in addition to just sort of moving around uh, so that we can see x z planes and y z planes we can also move this slider and this will change the z plane in which uh, we are looking at the sample so this will change the x the particular x y slice that we are looking at because we are moving along the z dimension uh, what else can we do with this display mode uh, first let me turn this off since it's not uh, super uh, useful in this particular sample we can resize by grabbing this so we can make things uh, different sizes. We can scroll in, um, which is perhaps a, a sort of a, a, a better place, uh, a, a better example of when to um, uh, resize this. So we can scroll in to zoom. We can right click and drag to move. And then we can sort of move wherever we're positioned uh, until we get a view where we see sort of the, the, the combination of things that, that makes it the most informative. We can also move the, the scale bar. This is also something that I forgot to, to show you in the section view, excuse me, in the slice view. So we can make it the scale bar thicker. We can make the text bigger. We can make it longer and we can position it uh, wherever we want. And so this is uh, useful if we're going to be taking snapshots. Um, so these are sort of some of the uh, basic things that we can do with this section mode uh, and it's really very very useful because uh, as you'll see in some coming examples this allows us to quickly determine whether one thing is inside another thing in three dimensions uh, as well as um, allowing us to navigate particular samples quite well so let me go back to arena mode and let me bring up an image uh, that comes from sort of my personal stash of images 
um, sort of courtesy of a user uh, that, that, that will allow you to um, kind of determine whether one thing, is, so exemplify how you can use this to figure out whether one thing is inside another. So these are data from Michael Meow, and it really doesn't matter the, the sort of the details of what he was doing, but he had labeled cells with some, some green marker that was on the membrane and uh, in some kind of internal vesicles, and also uh, labeled uh, some uh, sort of subsets of vesicles with a red fluorophore. And so if you have something like this, if you move in the Z dimension, you can see uh, sort of in the top left and sort of left panel, uh, this is a cell and you can kind of go in and you see stuff inside. And so you may have a lot of questions about this kind of thing, which are, for example, are these um, sort of green dots inside the cell or are they connected with the membrane? And so if you look at an image like this, it can sometimes be hard to make that determination because this might be connected through a tube to the membrane, even though you can see it in an XY view as being sort of not connected to the membrane. And so these side views really help because you can see this, this, this kind of thing uh, sort of these these dots in many cases are, are really not connected uh, to the membrane. They're very much in the middle of the cell, and so that is really something that's inside. Uh, similarly, if you look at these um, uh, other markers of particular kinds of vesicles, you can see uh, examples where they're sort of uh, partially surrounded, and so you can say, oh, that dot really is associated with this kind of vesicle as it's sort of surrounded by it, and something similar uh, you can see here, where uh, the staining is, is sort of not perfect, but you can get a pretty good idea that the sort of the green material there was somehow associated um, and, and inside this vesicle. So, so this can be a really useful uh, you know, a way of, of displaying data to very quickly make these assessments of whether certain things uh, are in particular locations inside a cell or a sample. Let me use another um, sample image um, from, this is from the Amaris demo images to illustrate uh, what's called an extended view. Um, so let me double click here. Uh, so, so this particular sample is a little bit different. Uh, this constitutes uh, this is the sample is uh, labeling in red uh, vasculature and in green a particular kind of cell, and so uh, it's a pretty thick uh, sort of uh, big in Z three dimensional stack. And if you look at any one plane, it's a little bit tricky to figure out what's going on. If you sort of go through them in Z, it's a little bit easier to figure out that this is some sort of a tubular network. And this is one one case we're clicking on Navi, so we see a three dimensional. Uh, projection gives you a better sense that these are all sort of tubes uh, with, with cells intermixed with them. But, but this is a bit busy, and so you may actually want to make a maximum projection over a more restricted range, and that's where this extended view comes into uh, comes comes really in handy. So if we click here, what we see now is that in addition to those white lines, we now have these yellow lines. And so what these yellow lines uh, indicate is a range over which we make a maximum intensity projection. So let's start here on the XZ view, where if we drag this down, you can see that this image, which is an XY image, changes. And the reason it changes is because this image gets replaced by a maximum intensity projection uh, along the Z axis from here to here. So the more I drag, you know, the more stuff appears, and if I dragged it all the way, I would be left with essentially the image in the bottom right-hand corner. So what this lets you do is do a maximum projection over a more restrained range, uh, which can be very useful if you're trying to get a sense of how things are behaving in 3D in a small layer and not uh, in the entire sample. Um, and it's it's interactive, so you can click wherever you want, and that will center this um, kind of window of projection. Uh, similarly to the Z dimension, you can project along the X dimension, which will change how your uh, Y, Z images, images look, as well as in the Y dimension. So you can project along the Y, which will change how your X, Z images look. And so when you're doing this kind of thing, um, you may want to show some of this to, to some of your colleagues. And, and so uh, if you want to take snapshots of, of something like this, 
uh, let, let me il use that to illustrate uh, and to kind of bring home an, an another point that I had sort of mentioned is that when you take snapshots, it's a good idea to try to layer information. And so what do I mean by this is sort of taking images that have features in common, but then maybe one or just two features that change so that uh, people can follow uh, kind of logically what you're doing. So for example, um, you know, if I were trying to illustrate this in a lab meeting, I might take an image like this, then have another one where I show all this sort of, these sort of extended projections, and then maybe another one where I would remove all the visual clutter just so people can see it, and then maybe with one channel and another. So now what we would have is if I go to uh, the snapshots, um, let's see if we can show this clearly. Um, right, so we you could show an image like this, explain what an X, Y, and, and uh, uh, X, Z, and Y, Z projection is, then show this extended projection where, where, where we're maximum projecting in the Z, in the X and in the Y, and then sort of remove the visual clutter and just show individual channels. So it's it's a very, I, I find it a very effective presentation technique to have a bunch of images that are all related to each other uh, and, and shown sequentially. People can follow your argument much, much easier if you do that. Um, so, so one final, um, one final example that I wanted to show you, which again is, is something that illustrates the power of the section view, uh, is uh, a brain. So uh, this again, it comes from some of my personal data stash, and this is um, this is data that I acquired myself, and it's just brain autofluorescence acquired with the light sheet microscope. Um, so the details of this don't matter much. The only thing that I want to bring your attention to is the fact that. Uh, these images uh, were acquired uh, such that the data looked like this. So the, the, these XY images are how the data came off the microscope. And so this is a rodent, uh, sort of a mouse brain. And with the brain oriented in this particular uh, way, it, it's uh, something called a sagittal slice of the brain. And uh, these other cuts represent other canonical uh, slicings of the brain. This is called horizontal, uh, sort of horizontal planes, and these are called coronal planes or coronal sections. And for for neuroscientists, these different um, these different ways of looking at the brain have different information, and people may be used to you know um, different variants, uh, and they may find it easier to find structures in this view or in this view. And so having the ability to have acquired data in one particular plane, but then being able to interpolate and get other planes very easily in the software can turn out to be a really powerful way of navigating a sample. Uh, it's 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 um, it, it's really a very effective way of, of navigating samples that have these particular symmetry planes, like um, like the brain, or or you know you, you may have other samples that have particular planes of symmetry that are uh, of interest to you, and so. Um, this, in addition, also helps you, uh, sort of a variant of this, which I'll show you uh, later, uh, allows you to kind of go uh, and make sense of a three-dimensional image based on these uh, planes. And so try and make sense of things in these views and where they are in 3D and of things that you see in 3D to kind of try and map them back to these planes to, to understand uh, what's going on with the sample. Uh, so that, that, that uh, sort of concludes uh, what I wanted to talk about in the section view. So now at this point, uh, we're ready to discuss the three-dimensional view in Imara. So this this one, which is uh, sort of the snazziest of all of them, um, and, but also the most complicated one and, and the one that you have to have, uh, you know, the most care with to, to try and extract information. So let's go to Arena and bring up something that will help illustrate uh, many of the features of this sort of three-dimensional display. So I'm going to go to the Mars demo images. Uh, and the one that I, I want to bring up first um, is plant cell. Uh, so I'm going to go to 3D view. And so um, when you go to 3D view, 
you will see that the um, the software automatically creates uh, th this panel here. And in this panel, it creates something called the scene, where there's a light source, a frame, and a volume. So the scene is just uh, the way the software calls the, kind of the entire file. And these three uh, items correspond to the following. So volume is your data. Okay, so if I turn it off, I don't see any more data. It's, it's the actual data that constitutes the image. Frame is this frame that surrounds the image and gives you some visual cues um, as to where things are located in three dimensions. Uh, and light source is something that illuminates uh, other elements that you can add to this scene uh, that go beyond the data. So since we don't have anything else at the moment, I'm not going to concentrate on that. Uh, we might revisit it later. Um, each of these elements can be uh, adjusted. Um, you sort of, you know, the display can be turned on and off, but they can also be adjusted by clicking on it, and then you have certain options here. So, for example, for the frame, we can add axis labels if we so wanted to. We can make them bigger by clicking on font and just making, you know, the the numbers bigger. Uh, we could add uh, sort of increase the spacing of the check marks. So some, maybe something like this would be not as cluttered. Um, you can remove tick marks. You can remove the grid. There's a lot of things that you can do um, to just kind of make this uh, more to your liking. So um, in volume, uh, you can adjust the rendering quality. And so by default, it goes to one setting below the maximum. If you prop it up a little bit more. You can sometimes, in, in samples that have a lot of features, see finer detail. This sample um, you know, doesn't really have much fine detail, so there's not a lot of a difference. Uh, but if you lower the rendering quality, uh, you will see a lot less detail. This can sometimes be useful if your uh, computer is having trouble displaying the data or when you manipulate it, which we'll do in a moment, if it seems to sort of chug along and slow down. Lowering the rendering quality may, may make it uh, snappier at the expense of you know, visual quality. So how do we uh, manipulate this image in three dimensions? So there's a few things we can do. Just like before, if we use the scroll wheel, we can zoom in and out of the image, and it's dynamic. So it zooms into whatever you're pointing at um, and then zooms out. Um, we can right-click to translate the image in the field of view. And so, for example, if I'm zoom in and then I want to move around, I can do that. We can also left click to rotate. And depending on you know where we start and what direction we go in, we'll, ro we'll rotate this in different dimensions. If we rotate it and keep moving when we release the left uh, click, uh, sort of the left um, mouse button, it will continue to rotate. So it has some sort of momentum. And we can, you know, if it goes too fast and it's kind of spinning around, we can just arrest it by um, clicking on it. Um, if we we get a little bit kind of lost, we can go back to reset and it'll take it back to the beginning. If we like a particular orientation, but we want it to fill the entire field of view, we can go to fit uh, and it will try to do that. Um, so, so those are some of the manipulations you can do to just look at different aspects uh, of a sample. And um, let's discuss now uh, in volume what these different modes are uh, of, of displaying the information. So uh, by default, things are opened in the maximum intensity projection mode, uh, where what you're seeing is a maximum intensity projection, so the brightest pixel along the current view of the image. So if we're looking like this, uh, we will see the maximum intensity pixels, in this case, sort of going from the back to the sort of front of the sample, sort of as pointing out of the screen. But if we rotate it this way, uh, we are max projecting along this axis. And so you can see that sort of bright things stay in the front. So for example, we have this bright object and this bright object. I have no idea what those are. But if I orient them in a way where they're sort of on top of each other, uh, I'll have a lot of difficulty seeing them because uh, we're just projecting along this angle. And I see the maximum. And they're both sort of uh, one is obscuring the other. So um, that's one way you can display things. Uh, the problem, so, so this is a very uh, useful way often, but one of the problems is it's sometimes hard to determine what is in front and what is in the back. And this is a great example. So this is, this sample is, is sort of a tube 
with, I believe, chloroplasts uh, all around the edge. And so here it's very hard to know whether some chloroplasts are in the front or in the back. And so th there are a few other um, display modes that can be useful in these circumstances to give us a little bit more depth perception. So one of them is blend, which I'm going to turn on now. Um, and I'm going to focus on the chloroplast, really. Um, so um, I've clicked on blend, I've removed cell wall, and then I'm going to click here on chloroplast. So what is all this stuff? Uh, so these are transparency controls. Uh, and so they're different from these brightness controls that we discussed at length before. And so the way they work is as follows. There's also a minimum and a maximum. Uh, but the way these works is, is as follows. Uh, pixels that have the minimum intensity or less are completely transparent. Pixels that have the maximum intensity or higher are as opaque as we make them here. And these three parameters correspond to manipulations we can make on the graph. So if we lower, so if we raise or lower this, we change the opacity. So if we lower it, everything is more transparent. If you make it higher, everything is more opaque, so you can't see through it. If we move this to the right, we increase the minimum, so we're making more things transparent. If we move this one to the left, uh, we're making more things opaque. And so by manipulating these settings, we get a better sense of what's in front and what's behind it. So like it's very clear that these things are now behind the ones in front. Um, so it can be a really useful display mode um, that helps with the sort of what's in front and what's in the back. Um, and we usually use this sort of graph shape in a step, so meaning everything above this is going to be opaque uh, to this degree, and everything below it is going to be um, transparent. There's also this peak uh, mode, and, and so this is a little bit harder to tell like when this might be useful. The idea is that if you have a range of intensities that you want to see, uh, this can make only those opaque and everything below and above certain pixel intensity values um, it will be completely transparent. I haven't found many examples where I find that useful, um, but but you might. And so it, it's worth kind of playing around with this. Uh, there's also normal shading, uh, which in addition to sort of the, this kind of, um, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of intrinsic shading of the sample, um, it also has shading um, that's uh, given by that light source that I mentioned before. So let's see if I can get something here that makes a little bit more sense. Let's see. And a lot of this depends on sort of the power of your computer because these are sort of more computationally intensive methods. Uh, but what you see is if I now click on light source and zoom out, the shadows are being cast sort of from this direction into that direction. So if I move this around, um, I will see shadows uh, that look, uh, you know, th that are cast in other directions. And, and th this kind of thing can be very useful if you want to emphasize certain ridges in the sample. If you put them, those ridges perpendicular to the illumination direction, that can really highlight them sort of uh, just by lighting them in a different way. Um, finally, there's shadow projection, which usually I would not recommend you use. And, and it's sort of a combination of this, but then you, you cast shadows on something behind you. Uh, the problem is that um, this can often be very computationally intensive, and so it's really not not worth it in many cases. So I would say for most of you, uh, maximum intensity projection is probably what you're going to do most often, and some of you might venture into blend or normal shading if you have a sample where that will allow you better depth perception and assignment of certain objects distributed over that volume. Um, okay, so... Uh, this uh, one of the nice things about MRS Viewer is that uh, it's 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 a full visualization package that can look at all uh, sort of the data in 3D, but it can even look at things that you created in the full version of MRS um, and, and just at least visualize it. Even though you won't be able to interact with those objects that you created in the full version of MRS, you will at least be able to. Um, uh, see them and, and adjust their visualization. So let's look at an example of this. Uh, I'm going to go back to Arena, to the demo, um, and so I'm the, the demo data, and I'm going to open plant cell with objects. So you can now see that this, um, it's going to take a moment to open. Um, let me sort of turn a bunch of stuff off here. Um, all right, so 
this is the data, same as before. All that's been adjusted is sort of how it's being displayed. Um, it's in right now it's in blend mode but you can see now that there are a bunch of other things and so what are these other things so these are objects that you can add in the full version of imaris and so there are point objects that you can add which are called spots and so here they added they, they did some automatic recognition of chloroplasts and you can see uh, even though um, these spots were added in the full version of imaris we can see them here and we can display them as spheres as center points, we can change their color. Uh, so for example, um, we can make them, you know, if we wanted to, we can make them pink. Um, we can have them make them have each a different color depending on, you know, their identity. Uh, we can have them be a little bit transparent. Um, so let me turn off the volume. And so you can see, you can, you can sort of see through them. You can have them different, um, you, you can make them have sort of different levels of, of, of different materials, excuse me. And then you can also have them coded by statistics. So for example, we could code them uh, based on the distance from an image border. Okay, so things that are um, kind of at a, at a, at a, at a long, sort of a bigger distance from the XY border, they show up in different colors. Um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So th there's a lot that we can do with this, um, even though we did not create the objects in this software. Uh, similarly, here's another object. This is a surface object. And uh, right now it's in, uh, you can see here in settings, it's in a slicer view. But basically what they did is they used uh, the cell wall to make uh, an object that shows where the cell wall is. Um, and so that's this object. Uh, which in a slicer view, you can sort of see in one slice what it looks like. But if I go back here to surface view, um, this shows the object that was created. And if you want, you can, let me turn off the raw data. You can make this object be, for example, a little bit more transparent. And then you can have the chloroplasts inside. Um, and so these are, um, and you can see that, that, that this object is, is kind of an envelope um, that, that, that shows you where the cell wall is. So again, we did not make this object in Imaris Viewer, but we can visualize it here. And similarly for cells, um, if I go to cells here, um, I go to volume display, let's see. So yeah, so this is maybe not the best example, but um, if, if this, this were a cell and it actually, actually had nuclei, uh, we can turn those elements on and, and see them. Uh, again, having not made any of this in, in MRS Viewer, and you have a lot of different kind of display options here that you can play with. Um, let me show you uh, another um, aspect of the 3D view, which I think is, is, is really useful. So, and which are things that you can do in MRS Viewer. So let me go back to Arena and let me go to one of my data sets, specifically sort of this brain. So let's let this open. And so when I talked about, you know, this particular sample, I showed you in section view, how you could sort of re-slice it uh, in different planes. So you can actually do that in three dimensions as well with something called the ortho slicer tool. So if we click here, you can see this says ortho slicer. Um, so this is a particular slice oriented in the XY plane. I'm going to turn off the volume so you can see it here. So you can see different slices in the XY plane, which are sagittal sections in this case. You can see different slices in the coronal plane or in the horizontal plane. Now this is really, really useful when you're trying to bridge 3D and 2D because uh, you may have trouble uh, figuring out where you are in the 3D view. So this, this might be you know, pretty complicated to figure out where you are, but if you just turn off the volume, you put on an ortho slicer and you find a particular location uh, that you're interested in, say here in the, um, in the 2D view, you can then see, okay, where is this in 3D? By clicking on the volume and then rotating this and you can see, oh, that's that's it, where in the brain that particular plane that I'm interested in is. Um, so it's a really good way of, of sort of 
using your 2D knowledge, uh, which may come from extensive knowledge of, of what sections look like, to figure out where those same places are in 3D. At the same time, you can use this in the other direction. So by starting with something interesting in 3D, so let's say you look at this and you're wondering what that is, and then placing a slicer at that position. Oh. And then trying to figure out where that is. So I was sort of missing. So another way of controlling the slider that doesn't involve this is the following. Uh, you can see that the, right now uh, we've always been in navigate mode. If you click on the escape key or on that button, we move to select mode. You can see that the cursor now looks like an arrow instead of this. So when the cursor is in this mode, we're in navigate, uh, we can rotate the sample. But when it's in this mode or select, we can interact with objects uh, in the sample. So we can, one of the things we can do is move this. So if I go back to navigate, I can then rotate the sample, turn off the volume, and this is that weird sort of blob that we saw sticking out the side. So again, this is uh, uh, these ortho slicers are a very useful way of um, bridging, uh, going between 3D and 2D, so sort of bridging that, that gap. Uh, you can add more than one. Uh, and, and you can make things that uh, look um, sort of like diagrams of the sun uh, with the middle cut out that I remember from sort of elementary school. Um, let's see if I can show you what I mean here. So you can see things like this, which again, I don't know if that's the, 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 the sort of best representation of this, but it can be useful in many cases to make this kind of diagram. Um, to sort of illustrate, break down something that's three-dimensional and very complex into something a little bit uh, easier to see. So let me uh, open a different image. So I'm going to go back to the Amaris demo images, and I'm going to go to microglia vasculature with objects. Um, OK, let's let this load up. And so in this case, uh, we can, I just want to illustrate the fact that these ortho slicers uh, can also be used uh, with the extended section uh, function that we had already discussed in, in, in the section mode. So this right now is a single section uh, in the XY plane. But here, if, if we look at this extended section section, I can increase this and make the image be uh, a maximum intensity projection in the z dimension from sort of this yellow line to this yellow line. So you could see it here. Sort of that chunk is being maximum intensity projected. And that's what I'm seeing here. So you can combine uh, sort of the functionality of the ortho slicer with this extended section view. And again, you can move it by either moving this or going to select and moving it up and down. OK, um, I just wanted to show you that particular functionality of the uh, ortho slicer. So let's go to a different uh, sample so I can show you a few more things. All right, um, where is what I'm looking at? I'm looking for something called retina. Uh, OK, let's open it here. OK, so, so this is a really complicated sample where you know, we have some stuff uh, in red and collagen and then G GFAP in green, and it's a little bit hard to see like what's in front what's in the back and you know one of the things we can do is sort of this blend view which really helps figure out what's in the front and when what's in the back uh but but this is a, an example where sort of cutting away some of the sample uh might give us uh kind of an, an easier way of visualizing it or, or visualizing some features of it um so let's 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 first um before we do that address the fact also that uh in this sample a particular plane of interest may not align with um, you know, the X, Y, and Z. So for example, if I want to see what's happening in kind of in the middle of this, this is at an angle, so I can't really see it um, with, with an ortho slicer that's placed you know, along one of these canonical planes. And so um, what do we do in that case? Well, instead of using an ortho slicer, I'm going to delete that one, uh, we can use an oblique slicer. And so in an oblique slicer, 
it looks similar to the other one, but it but it has this 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 thing here. And so what is that thing? So first we can select kind of a base plane, uh, and I'm going to select um, actually this one because I kind of want to draw that orthogonal slicer here. And so the way you do that is as follows. Let me turn off this. Um, if you change to select, you can move the slicer by grabbing it from this sort of thick part, and you can rotate it by grabbing it from the thin part. And so by rotating it, you can get a slice along a different axis, and you can switch between select and navigate to first rotate that, then move and see what the effect was. So for example, it's a little crooked now. All right, so something like that. That's more or less kind of where I wanted it, maybe a little bit here. There we go. So, so now I have um, a view of this along a plane that I'm more interested in. So now if I remove the volume, I can see this, which you know previously with just the orthogonal slicer, I couldn't have gotten that particular slice. And so if your sample is oriented in a way that the plane along which you want to cut it to see it in two dimensions is, is not one of these x, y, x, z, or x, uh, or YZ planes, the oblique slicer presents a solution. And again, you can do this extended sectioning uh, there as well. So um, that's if you want to be able to see these slices. But but there's another application for this, uh, for, for sort of a similar idea, is that sometimes you just want to cut this open and be able to see sort of half the sample, for example. And so, you know, we might want to just, you know, cut the lid off of this and just see kind of the back. And so how would that work? Um, so here's an ex uh, here, here's how this would work. You use this tool, uh, which is a clipping plane. So a clipping plane, it, it looks superficially similar to the orthogonal slice, uh, slicer or the oblique slicer, but you can see that, you know, now we've sort of cut off the top. So if I turn this off, you can see there's the whole thing. And now I've, I've actually removed it. Um, and again, just like the oblique slicer, if I go to the select mode, either by clicking there or by you know, hitting the escape key, you can grab the thick one and move the position of this, or you can grab the thin one and control the angle. And you can see that this uh, is, looks like a needle, and that's because it's showing you the side to which it's pointing. So if we wanted to flip that, we would be cutting off the other side, and you know we can start from various sort of typical planes and then kind of curve, uh, sort of tilt this however we want. Uh, one one important thing when you're doing this this kind of clipping plane uh, is that it will clip, so it will not show you uh, the things that are on this side of all the objects that are below it in this list. So for example, if I move the frame above it in the list, it would not clip the frame. And so you can imagine using various combinations of this to um, to, to have uh, kind of views where you're displaying data and, and how the data, the raw data, turns into analyzed data. And so that's what I'm, I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to go to Arena again and show you a version of this sort of retina with objects. So, so this is the same data set, but it has a bunch of stuff layered on. And hopefully that will give you a better sense of how you can use that clipping plane effectively. So if I go back here, uh, oops, I apparently didn't double click on it. Let me double click on retina with objects. There we go, it's loading. And so here's an example of this uh, kind of on steroids. So we have all sorts of stuff going on here. Um, so let, let, let's kind of first dial it back to the basics. This is the data, same as before. Uh, there are two surfaces here. So there's an object that encloses uh, sort of this collagen staining. There's another object that encloses the GFAP. Um, so those are things that are created in the in the full version of MRS. And then uh, there was an ortho slicer added here. So you can see um, kind of one slice uh, and then a clipping plane. And so if you look, the clipping plane is between the volume and the ortho slicer. So if the things below it, the volume is cut but the ortho slicer is not. So you get this effect of sort of seeing kind of a combination of 2D and 3D, which can be quite effective um, in many cases for displaying your data. And you could move you know, things above and below this uh, and to sort of highlight different features. So you could imagine doing something like this, for example. So um, you know, we could have these surfaces above the clipping plane uh, but the red ones below it. And so now 
you would sort of see green everywhere, but you would have the red cut in half, and maybe that would allow you to see how these filaments uh, interdigitate with this. Um, so anyway, there's a lot to play with there, and, and it can really help uh, to bring out certain features in your sample. So there's one uh, final thing I want to show you, which is uh, time-lapse settings. Um, so I'm going to open this file, R18 demo with objects. And so when you have a time-lapse, so I'm not sure what, what this is. It's just a bunch of uh, blobs uh, kind of moving around uh, as you move in time. But um, I already discussed in, in sort of the example that came from my own PhD work how to you know go to play or adjust the settings. But here what I want to show you is that if you have objects uh, during a time lapse, uh, you can make trails. So you can see how objects move along trails. And so these are uh, so the settings you, you can explore here, but you can sort of see the full trail. Uh, you can see a dragon tail, which shows you sort of uh, a little tail from only sort of recent data points. Um, you can make these balls whatever diameter you want, and then you can even um, make the, uh, the, 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 the tails and the objects have uh, kind of colorings that depend on their time, uh, sort of when they appear or how long their tracks are. Uh, so again, just to show you that even if you have this data where you didn't, um, uh, you didn't generate this in Imaris Viewer, you generated it in, in the full version of Imaris, if you're using Imaris Viewer to show this data to your lab, you can really access a lot of different um, settings here to adjust how they look uh, and be able to highlight different features of your data set. Um, so that, that concludes what I wanted to show you. Um, there's, there's a lot more um, to uh, Imaris itself, the full version that, you know, this is viewer, so I don't have the ability to show you any of those things. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me and I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to, to discuss how uh, maybe the full version of MRS can help you for image analysis purposes. Or if you had any questions about Viewer, I'm, I'm happy to, to chat with you about them as well. I hope this was useful and do reach out by email if you have any questions.